Thank you, brothers. It's an honor to me. In fact, I'm really humbled to be in the company of the other speakers. They're all uh, my senior, and they have all taught me. I... There are leagues. There are weight classes, and don't deny it. And I'm not in their weight class. You guys are heavyweights. Story of Joseph. I know it's late. It's Friday night, and in... Uh, the words of Henry VIII to his fifth wife, I will not keep you long. <laughs> Join me in Genesis and let us look at Joseph. As we do now, turn our attention to the lessons of these great men in Scripture. We are men and we do come together for men's conferences and it's right that we should. We've got so much in common. We have so much, there's so much about us that can only be explained by the design of God. He made us to be men. At the same time, there's only, you know, the other reality that so much about what we are can only be explained by sin and its effects on the design of God. Men and women, very different, and there's a reason for us to come together as men. Without the women present, to be reminded of certain things, as much as it is relevant for them to get together as women, as they do. Of course, they gauge it all differently. My wife always wants to know things like, you know, did the men, did they cry? <laughs> no. And that wasn't even our goal. <laughs> to try to, and, but the, with them and their gatherings, it's, it's measured in, in buckets. But then again, they've got so much to cry about, being married to us. I heard a, but I, in the differences between men and women are truly God's doing. And at times they are quite extreme. The differences between us, differences between men and women. I recently introduced um, at another gathering, it was a pastor's uh, event all different denominations uh, represented. And I had the privilege of introducing this old Baptist pastor who's uh, retired from the pastoral role. Now he and his wife, you know, they're, they are on this journey together um, around the country doing marriage conferences. They've been focusing on that in the final season of their, you know, their work together. He authored a book. His name is Dr. Fred Lowry. He authored this book, um, Covenant Marriage, which I highly recommend. And... In, in the course of his talking to us pastors, he was going on and on about, you, you, you got to, as men, you have got to use the three words. And he, the way he did this thing, when he set it up, he kind of heightened all of our anticipation. What are the three words? You can think of, you know, these three words that if you will speak them, you will affect the woman's heart. You'll, you, if you will just, and you, you know, you think, what could it be? I love you, or I was wrong. There's a lot of... <laughs> A lot of sets of three words that I suppose a man could say to his wife. But the man said, no, no, the three words. You have got to use, you've got to die to yourself and express those three words. What are they? You've got to look to her and say to her, tell me more. <laughs> is that not profound? Isn't it? It is profound. He said... You gotta say, tell me more. When inside you wanna go, will you shut up? <laughs> but there are certain realities that we, what, what is, I told you guys a long time ago, I, I uh, as a young man needing to be discipled and needing to be trained in ministry, left the Northeast for the Deep South. In fact, I spent four very memorable years of my life in Alabama in rural Alabama, learning some simple, plain things about reading and explaining. And I was exposed to the preaching of one particular Assembly of God pastor. I can only remember him as Brother Holmes. Brother Holmes looked so much like Jed Clampett from the, from the, the hillbillies. He really had that white hair, tall, lanky fella, played steel guitar, and always showed up dressed kind of like Colonel Sanders. Um, white suit or something pastel with white shoes. Man, that guy could preach. He was a blessing to me. 
And among the most profound things I heard from Brother Holmes was the statement, well, gl well, glory to God, what is fellowship? Glory to God, fellowship? Well, that's two feathers in the same ship. And Brother Holmes is right on the money. And we are, in fact, there's so much we have in common in that we are made in the image of God and we were made men. There's a whole lot we have in common with this character that we got to give our attention to right now. In Genesis chapter 37, the story of Joseph begins, and if I may, the time that we have, may I point out to you the things that we have in common? The things that we have in common with each other, we have in common with Joseph. Genesis 37 verse 1 says, And Jacob dwelled in the land wherein his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob, Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a coat of many colors. When his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Now the first two things that you and I have in common with Joseph. Number one, brothers, we are, as he was, loved. We are, all of us, loved by our father. We are objects of his love, objects of his special attention. He, he knew us before the foundation of the world. Truly loved. The, the extent of that love that God has had for every single one of us goes beyond all of the sunrises that we've been allowed to see despite our sin. It goes beyond all of the things that God has put up with from you and me. It, 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 the love of God most profoundly expressed by his willingness to send his son, his only son, his only begotten son, that his love for us was such that he created the world, that he created humanity and, and created free moral agency, knowing the choices that all of humanity would make. And that the hell that would result in the love of God was such that he was willing, that he counted it all worth it. Even the reality that he would subject himself to hell as a man, that he would, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man, Hebrews chapter 2. And that death was more than just the physical death he experienced on the cross, which paid the price, but actually experiencing, as he cried out from the cross, I thirst actually experiencing what real death is. If real life is known, as our Lord Jesus said, John 17, 3, this is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Then real death is known as is, is separation from God, banishment from God. You know, I had, I had this kid ask me the other day, 14-year-old, as he's wrestling through theological issues. He said, if God knows everything, if he does, if he can look into the future and know it all, why would he make us free to sin? And then knowing that we would have to experience judgment and hell. And if he really loves everybody, why would he even make people that he would know would choose against him, that would reject Christ? That, as a 14-year-old male wrestling with that question, and I readily admitted to him, young man, you're dealing with things that are beyond all of us. And, you know, I commended him for, for taking on the thoughts, but this is so far beyond all of us. 
There's no one who has an answer for that. that is, the, the only answer I could give to him was that he loved you so much that he said it was worth it. Though all the pain that he would experience as God. When he says plainly through the prophet like Ezekiel, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that, but that rather he would turn, that he would repent. God, please, oh, why will you die? You know, that he would subject himself to the pain. that his own heart has endured because he loved us so much he determined it was worth doing. <laughs> One time I had this old lady say to me, well, if, I, if I had any idea of the pain that was, it was going to cause me, I never would have had any children at all. I said, but Grammy, Grammy. <laughs> What are you saying? <laughs> and that's true, no joke. It wasn't worth it? Come on. You got me out of the deal. I, I <laughs> Apparently she wasn't buying it. You are loved, brothers. You are so loved. The very first time the word appears in scripture, the word love appears in relation to a father for his son, as God in Genesis chapter 22 said to Abraham, calling him, I want you to offer up your son, your only son whom you love. <laughs> you are loved. And all through your whole life, God has been demonstrating it, even if we're too stupid to notice it. He's that way. <laughs> he, he is who he is. He's what he is. He is what his nature commands that he should be. And according to his son, he is good. He sends the sun to shine on the good and the evil. The, the rain falls on the just and the unjust. God sends sun and rain even to the unthankful, the Lord Jesus sent. We loved. But we are also hated. This is reality. Even as Joseph was hated, you are hated. <laughs> You're hated. You are so hated. You are made in the image of God. And there is this created being who has utter contempt for you is a higher form of life, at least at this time. God made man a little lower than the angels, and there's the highest order of all angelic beings that in this rebellion against God, his thought that he could ascend. He has utter contempt for you and all of those angels that followed him. They hate you. You are so hated. You are hated by them, and you're, you know what? Check this out. You, particularly you, Christian men, you're hated by your fellow man who hate him. They hate Jesus Christ, and you identify yourself with him. Now they hate you too. In fact, they hate you and call you the hater. The insanity of it. You've experienced favor, even as Joseph did. You have experienced favor. The part of the hatred that the enemy of your soul has for you is because of the love that God has for you. You listen, to, you, you, you guys have heard the pre you surely you've turned on what they call Christian television. And you've heard the preachers that like to wax, all dramatic. Some of them guys belong on like the WWE. Some of them really do. They, they should be managers. They should be the, the mouthpiece. You know what I mean? They, they, especially when they go off on the devil. They go off on the devil and, they, and oh, they'll, they'll go on about that old devil. He's a defeated foe. Why? He's a toothless lion. He, and they'll go on and on like that, ignoring the fact that the Apostle Peter says, be ye sober and be ye vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, goeth about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. That sounds like a legitimate and real threat, a real danger. It's not a danger of you being gummed to death. This, this, this reality that he is defeated 
doesn't mean he can't destroy. He's still a destroyer. Anyway, you, you are hated. You are so hated. <clears throat> Verse 5 says, And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it his brethren. They hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. <laughs> you, can tell, you can tell there's a little social retardation happening here. <laughs> This, this guy's got some things to learn. If he thinks these guys are all going to be really into this dream, I had the most amazing dream. You guys were all bowing to me. Is that awesome or what? I'll tell you this. This is another thing you and I got in common with Joseph. We are a mix. We really are. Joseph is a mix, really. His story, he's a mix at this season of, of potential, you know, and some virtue, we'll see that as the story unfolds, but also some stupid, huh? He's a mix of virtue and stupid. At 17, is he not? Come on. Breakfast is not going well. But this is the other thing you got in common with, Joseph. He dreamed. You also have dreamed. We all dream. We were, we were boys once, and we dreamed of being men, and we dreamed of being respectable. We dreamed of being great before we settled for just a little pleasure. We learned to settle. I've said all over this country, I've said, man, God called us to greatness. And so many of us will trade the opportunity for greatness for pleasure. We start out as boys dreaming one day I'm going to be a man and I'm going to be great. And people will see it. And, I, and I'll be respected. We have this God-given desire to be great. The Son of God didn't say, quit that greatness thing. He said, no, I'm going to tell you how to be great. How about that? Let me give you some advice. You want to be great? Be a slave. Humble yourself. You want to go up? I'll tell you. The other, go the other direction, and you will. Go down, and you'll go up. Everybody who humbles himself will be exalted. You want to be exalted? Humble yourself. But he doesn't say, quit with that greatness thing. That's stupid. No, he says, I'll tell you how. I will tell you how to be great. Joseph had a dream that one day his brothers, even his father and his mother, would see. Such dreams exist in all of us. You have dreams. And even I maintain even the more so when you have surrendered your life to the Lord, it all gets revived again. When, you know, you, the dreams, when you're, when you're a boy, you want to be great, you want to be respectable. A new sort of dream is born or, or in a sense revived. It's, it's something that's written on the heart of every single man. Every man has a need to be believed in, to be significant. God put it there. It is from the Lord. It's his doing. And it gets revived when we come to the Lord. Us prodigals all come home. We start to see the, the possibility that we could do some things for the Lord, that he could use even us. Dreams are born. You all got dreams. Joseph had dreams. You have that in common with him. But we're all quite a mix. Are we not still, even to this hour, a mix of virtue, faith, and stupid? There's a reason why. Our master taught us that we should pray every day. Lead us not into temptation and deliver us from the evil one. There's nothing in what he taught us about daily prayer that anticipates a time when we have got it all down and mastered life and are completely free of the possibility of stupid. So Joseph goes on about his dream. He said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. Verse 6. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood around about and made obeisance to mine. Sheaf, well. His brethren said to him, Shall thou indeed reign over us? Shall thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. And he dreamed yet another dream and told it to his brethren. 
And said, behold, I, I dreamed a dream more. If you like the last one, you're going to love this one. <laughs> and behold, the sun and the moon made obeisance unto me. Damn. Can you see this guy at breakfast doing this stuff? But it turns out these were dreams from the Lord. These are true. Let's not forget what they were true dreams. Obviously, he's got some social problems that prevent him from making a better presentation. I mean, a better presentation might have included something like, guys, this is crazy. I know. I know this is crazy. I know I don't deserve what I'm dreaming, but can I just tell the dream? And will you please not just hate me for it? There's any case, anything other than, hey guys, another dream. <laughs> Can you just imagine those guys going, oh, please tell us more? <laughs> he told it to his father. And to his brethren, and his father rebuked him, and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee to the earth? So his father actually interprets the dream. He interprets it. And it's an accurate interpretation, really. His brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying. His brothers envied, but his father observed. His father has had some experiences with God. His father has also had God reveal himself in a dream. Can't be too quick to say, that's impossible. That's pizza dream. He can't be too quick to say anything like that because he's had his own experiences. He observed. He noted. All his brethren went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said unto Joseph, do not thy brethren in the flock... Feed the flock in Shechem, come, and I will send thee unto them. And he said to them, here am I. What can we see in this um, little bit we have right here? Well, there's a guy that his father trusts. He's earned trust. Trust has been given, and it has been um, responded to by a degree of faithfulness. He's a ready servant. Here I am. Verse 14, he said unto him, Go, I pray thee, and see whether it be well with thy brother and whether well with the flocks, and bring me word again. So he sent him out of the vale of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. Bring me word. He has, Jacob has discovered he, he's trustworthy, and he brings a faithful word. It may be an evil report, but it's the truth. It may be bad news, but it's true. And so he is, um, he's, trust, he's trusted by his father. He is a faithful witness. It is worth noting. Verse 15 says, A certain man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the veil. And the man asked him, saying, What seekest thou? And he said, I seek my brethren. Tell me, I pray thee, where they, where they feed their flocks. And the man said, They, depart, they are departed hence. For I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. Joseph went after his brethren, found them in Dothan. When they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. So here's another thing you get in common with Joseph. Though you dream, there is a conspiracy afoot to keep your dream from ever being realized. There is, in fact, a conspiracy. There are those who conspire. Now, you guys are all aware that, th that there are people, even among our family, Christian brothers that are really given to conspiracies. And, and so many of them go too far. You've seen that, right? You've seen that so many of the conspiracy theories with regard to, you know, world events have a tendency to attribute way too much genius to humans. They have a tendency to always attribute way, way, in fact, they credit men with the ability to keep secrets that men really don't have. They don't. Benjamin Franklin, the quotable Franklin, said, yeah, two men can keep a secret if one of them is dead. That was Franklin. <laughs> that was his way of saying it. It's, secrets leak. They get out. People talk. You know? I heard a, a military genius in an interview 
say a few years ago, and I remember it struck me, as he was answering a question, but he said, don't be so quick to credit anything going on on earth to human genius when human stupidity is a better explanation. <laughs> I agree with him. But there is a conspiracy, and it is devilish. It's satanic in nature. There is, in fact, there are, in fact, forces that conspire against you. And if it cannot totally drag you down, they will do all they can to, to diminish your potential for what you can accomplish and the greatness that you can attain to. They hate you, and they want to stop you. And they have means. They, they, they track us, and they, they have advantages. They, they can see us. We can't see them. They, this, is, this is a reality. There is a conspiracy. That is a reality. You have that in common with Joseph. Tell, guys, look, um, you look back at your own story. Look back at just the amount that you do know, and you know what I'm saying is true. There is a conspiracy. You have an enemy of your soul that wants to destroy you and has nearly succeeded a number of times, right? How many of us in this room right now shouldn't even be here? But for the grace of God at work in our lives, man, there is a real life conspiracy. And there are those who hate you, and they want to destroy your potential of really glorifying God and being truly great. They do. So what do they say? When they saw him, verse 18 says, they saw him even a long ways off. They conspired against him to slay him. And they said to one another, Behold, this, this dreamer cometh. Come now, therefore, and let's slay him. Cast him into some pit, and we'll see what will become. We'll see some evil beast has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. We'll, we'll fix his stupid dreams. This dreamer cometh, literally translated, dream ma the dream master, or master in his own dreams, legend in his own mind. Oh, look who's coming, the dream master. Well, we got to skip down, because we don't have time to do this whole thing, verse by verse, expositionally, and it promised not to keep you late. There's a couple of things I do want to point out to you that at, at the, um, when you go to chapter 39, verse 1, where it says, and Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian brought, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had bought him, that had brought him down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph. That's the thing I'd like to point out to you. The Lord was with Joseph. That phrase, the the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian, and his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did prosper in his hand. Joseph found grace in his sight, and they served him. He made him an overseer over his house, and all that he had he put into his hand. It came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer in his house over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. Then the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand. He knew not aught he had, save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. He, that the Lord was with him. I'm telling you, brothers, do you not have that in common with Joseph? The Lord is with you and it is the blessing of God. At work in our lives, it brings us to where we are tonight. It is the blessing of God. It is no virtue of us. You know something I, I, I learned a long time ago from Pastor Bill Gallantson, who I remember many years ago, him addressing Hebrews chapter 11, and said, I know we call this the hall, the hall of faith. He goes, but look again. Is it not the hall of grace? Grace, faith is just a response to the grace. <laughs> it is, you know, by faith, by faith, by faith, all through the thing. But it's grace. Who's the author and the finisher of our faith? Who produces this faith in us? But the Lord, Lord who's been with us. 
We have not got what we deserve. None of us have. What a stupid thing we think. Whenever we go, I think God is punishing me. Or well, the punishment of God looks a whole lot worse than the inconveniences and the, you know, the, the minor pains of life on earth. The punishment of God involves verbs like crush. As in Isaiah 53, yet it pleased the Lord to crush him. Nothing, no bad thing we've ever gone through has ever been God punishing us. None of us have got what we deserve. <laughs> the Lord has been with us. How is it that we even have the mental capacity left with all the things we've been through and done to ourselves to even respond to his goodness, but that he has preserved us? He has. The Lord has been with us all along, even we didn't recognize it. The Lord is with Joseph. The Lord is with Joseph. It, you know, it says it again, even after he is falsely accused, and certainly that's often the focus of, you know, any study on Joseph, is how he handled the temptation with Potiphar's wife. And it, certainly that does reveal a couple of things to us. You know, one, of the, one thing that we got to look at in this study In verse 21, he, gives, he goes to prison. In verse 20, it says, And Joseph's master took him and put him in the prison. On a place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in the prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy. Mercy? See, it, it, Joseph's whole story is not about Joseph's merit. Commendable as it was that Joseph would have an opportunity as he had with what we presume, and I think legitimately, was a beautiful woman. Because if you're rich and powerful, you can afford beauty. Potiphar was. And let us assume, I think legit, it's a legitimate assumption, that, that, that it was a, a, an amazing opportunity that most men would have read completely different and going, hey, what, what more can I do? I am a slave, after all. I am a servant. <laughs> there's all kinds of rationalization and justification and, and games. Mental, there's, a, there's a slick, lying Philadelphia lawyer in every one of us <laughs> that needs to die. <laughs> always making a case, always building a case for us to, to do something stupid. Wicked, simple, thoughtless. He shouldn't be fired. He shouldn't be disbarred. He should be hung. He should be killed. You know what I'm talking about. He's, he's slick. Slick Philadelphia lawyer in our flesh. But Joseph, it is certainly worth noting that he resists the temptation. But the statement, the Lord was with Joseph and he showed him mercy and gave him favor on the side of the keeper of the prison. The keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all of the prisoners that were in the prison, whatsoever they did there. He was the doer of it. <laughs> whatever they did, he was the doer. Remember what the Lord Jesus said in um, like the 16th chapter of Luke, where he said, you know, he, he that's faithful with that which is least will be faithful in that which is great. He that is unfaithful in that which is least will be unfaithful in that which is great. Whatever it is we are right now doing is what we will do when whatever it is has been amplified. You, you treat the dollar, you will treat the, the hundred the same way you treat the dollar. You'll treat the thousand the same way you treat the dollar. Or well, the million. The, the, the foolishness of people. You guys all know this that say, look, God, give me... Help me win. You know, they're buying lottery tickets and going, God, come on, let me win. I will cut you in. I'll cut you in. I will give you a tenth. But they're not tithing now. So God knows it to be a lie. Whatever you're doing with what is little. So, you know, Joseph, and, and the Lord in that same context said, if you are not faithful with that which is another's, who is going to give you that which will be your own? So the interesting thing about Joseph's life is that Joseph does basically the same job in every season of his life. He starts out, he's been trained to be the manager of his father's estate, the long coat. 
indicates the position that, God, that his father had, you know, trained him for. He's an overseer. He's doing math. He's managing. What does he do when he ends up a slave? Well, I, I, I manage. I got some math skills. And he manages. And he oversees an estate. And what does he do in prison? He, he goes he, managing. And he'll continue to be doing this gig. And all of this is, is taking him somewhere where ultimately he's going to manage the economy of a nation, an empire. Joseph's story is really something else, man. It's really amazing. But it's, 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 it comes right down to this one thing. The Lord was with him. No, it's not he was with the Lord. The Lord was with him. Have we not all discovered that God's grip on us is greater than our grip on him? Haven't we proven it? The Lord has been always, he's been with us. And ultimately the story of Joseph comes to his big climax. Where he reveals himself to his brothers. Chapter 45. And I'll end there, skipping over a whole lot. Parts of the story crack me up, man. He's in prison, and you know, that, that one day, <laughs> the scriptures go, he comes in, and these two guys, the butler and the baker, and they were, and behold, they were sad. Well, they're in prison. <laughs> Joseph is so not wrapped up in his own. One of the things you got to give it to Joseph about, he's not all wrapped up in self. He's like, but what about my circumstances? What about me? What about my needs? The guy, he's the kind of guy that comes in prison and goes, Hey, morning, fellas. Why do you look so sad? <laughs> it's, like, it's like one of those things that shouldn't be asked in prison. <laughs> Why are you looking so sad? <laughs> and then they go, oh, we had these dreams. They say, oh, dreams, yeah. <laughs> dreams, yes. Yeah, yeah. Say no more, dreams. And they and they they give their you know they go well let's just look at them man what's the dream I mean it's from the Lord you know interpretations are from the Lord and and the one guy you know he's got this dream and and involves his head and three or something and 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 when when Joseph goes this is awesome I know what it is three days from now Pharaoh is going to lift up your head and restore you to the office you had and the other guy goes ooh 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 tell me more tell me more and he 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 saw that that was good. And he's like, oh, come on, what was my dream? And Joseph's like, ah, oh, listen, I don't think you really want to know. <laughs> no, come on, come on, come on, what's my dream? Listen, no, uh, can we just change the subject? No, listen, what does my dream mean? Well, it, it, it involves your head, <laughs> like the other guy, and in three days. Do I have to say any more? Uh, all right, in three days, Pharaoh's going to lift up your head off your shoulders, okay? There's some funny stuff in there, man. It really is. But ultimately, it all comes down. This whole charade. Joseph, the day actually comes where his dream is realized. But he's been changed. He's been taken on this amazing journey of suffering that involves pain. And it's a law. We've covered this before. No pain, no gain, right? Joseph comes to the place where his brothers are bowing before him, and he's not gloating. He is suppressing tears. He plays this charade because, he, of course, he looks different. He's way older now. Now he's approaching the end of his 30s. They haven't seen him since he was 17. Years and scarring, time passing, uh, Egyptian fashion, probably involving a shaved head, shaved face, or a little braided beard or something, and, and eyeliner. I don't know. It, it, uh, <laughs> Some weird stuff going on culturally. Uh, even way, way back then, they were, after all, a pagan people. And his brothers all show up, all bearded and manly. But they don't recognize him, mostly because all they see is his feet, because they're bowing, right? They are bowing, and they are bowing before him. And, and, and he takes him on this, you know, this mind game, which had a purpose. And the purpose was to discover... What has time done with them? 
and, and discover how uh, have they is, have they been, have they learned anything? Would they still do it today? It's like a second chance. He puts them in a position where they got to step up sa sacrificially, or at least one of them must, for his brother Benjamin. He sees some things. But the whole time they're talking in Hebrew and they're going on lamenting how they have been tormented, haunted by their brother. They haven't been free. They have suffered greatly. When Joseph in chapter 45, verse 1, then Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him. And he cried, Cause every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. Awkward moment for his brothers. The mean man, the powerful man, is all of a sudden ordering everyone out. He's speaking Egyptian. And they just see everyone leave and it's just him and them. And then he starts having a breakdown. Verse 2, he wept aloud. And the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard. Now that's, that's serious weeping. It's a lot that was pent up, you know, and it just finally comes out. He, he's like, he cries. There's a lot to it that he's been years. He wept a lot. And, and those guys, his brothers, have got to be thinking things are bad. They're really bad. But now they've really taken a worse turn because the mean man is emotionally unstable. And he's like, he's like crying. <laughs> he's like, crying. oh, wow. And then when he does speak, he speaks in their language. Joseph, in verse 3, said unto his brethren, three words that had to have frightened them more than anything. I am Joseph. Doth my father yet live? The wonderful thing about the Bible is it never exaggerates. We talk in so much exaggeration in our culture. We use hyperbole. We overstate everything. I'm starving. I'm stuffed. Now I'm roasting, I'm freezing. And because the Bible doesn't do that, sometimes we don't appreciate the full impact of what it says. The statement, and his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. <laughs> I mean, that says a lot, doesn't it? They were troubled. Troubled. You. You. The guy we've been bowing to? The guy, the guy with all this power? You're the kid, brother, we've been haunted by? They were troubled. Joseph said to his brethren, come near to me, I pray you. And they came near. He said again, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. That's kind of about that. Uh, yeah, let's... Kind of hoping you wouldn't bring that up. You still sore about that? Uh, sold you, uh, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold. You sold into Egypt. And at that moment, if if you're them, you're thinking, "Oh dear God, payday has come. It has come. It's here." Yeah, yeah. You know, you're wondering how I got here. You you sold me here. But he follows it up with these words of kindness. Now, therefore, be not grieved nor angry with yourselves. He had the opportunity to discover that they had been grieved and they had been angry. Do you know what it's like to have regret? I reckon we do, don't we? Are there things that we were grieved and angry with ourselves? Don't you get mad at yourself? When you think of what you did and what you could have done, you, oh, the beatings that you would inflict if you could. Just get yourself out somewhere. Take yourself to the woodshed, right? <laughs> and Joseph says in such kindness to his brothers, don't do that anymore. Be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. These two years have the famine been in the land, and there are yet five years in which there shall be neither earring nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve life. He said it again. God sent me. 
and to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by great deliverance. Look at verse 6. I'm sorry, look at verse 8. So it was not you that sent me hither, but God. He hath made me a father to the Pharaoh and lord of all his house and ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Man, it wasn't you, it was God. Now you, all right, so the, the big theological problem instantly happens for some people like you going to say, now you're going to tell me right now, you telling me. It, 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 what you're saying is that God is responsible for them brothers' sin. And, and, and all I can tell you is the end of this book of Genesis in chapter 50. They think, his brothers think, oh, he's just being nice to us because our father's alive and then their father J Jacob dies and they all come in and they're like, hey, listen, um, listen, you know, our, our father said, and, and he, he realizes that they are still expecting wrath and vengeance from him. And he says to them then, look, listen, I as for you, you intended it for evil, but God. Use it for good. God. I ask you this at the end of the study. Do you, can you look back and say, and, and recognize the hand of providence? See, that's what the old timers always referred to it as. The greatest men who've lived, they always spoke about the hand of providence, and they recognized the hand of God involved in human lives. A few years ago, Joe Foch gave me the biography of Abraham Lincoln. It's written by Joe Wheeler. I know I told you about that probably already. But th there's a classic example of a really good biographer, Joe Wheeler, who does the story of Lincoln and goes, here's the hand of providence. And here, at this point, God opened this door and, and set up this relationship. I'm reading right now um, a book I highly recommend to all of you. Forgive me, I forgot the author's name. He, he signed it and gave me the copy. It is God and Churchill. And it, again, focuses on the hand of providence, the work of God in the life of somebody like Winston Churchill. There's a guy who, who's, you know, he's, his Victorian sort of thinking parents ship him off to boarding school, as, you know, aristocrats did in that culture. And it caused him great pain as he pleaded through letters for his mom and his dad to please come and be involved in his life. And they were, you know, there was, the kids were a nuisance. But the hand of providence, there was a, one nanny, one dear lady, that he would call womany for the rest of his life. And she was, she, she was low church. And because she was one of them low church people, she actually believed the Bible and invested Bible knowledge, and she poured it into him, and she prayed over him all those years of his pain as a child. And then the author here goes on to talk about how all of that shape, when you, when you, he, he does a masterful job of saying, look at all of the, the skeptics and all of the liberal theology did to pave the way for the mentality that produced a Hitler. You know, him and all of his, his scientism combined with paganism and all of that is being produced over here on one side of the English Channel. And on the other side, there's somebody like Winston Churchill learning the Sermon on the Mount and being profoundly affected where he recognizes his mission is to save Christian civilization. You know, Churchill at the age of 16 is quoted outside that boarding school after a chapel at 16 telling one of his friends, I don't know when, but I know sometime in the future, all of England is going to be in danger and they're going to look to me to save them and to save London. You know, all right, so that's the kind of thing all 16-year-olds dream, right? And say stuff like that, but not all of them have it actually happen. The hand of God was at work in his life, and he recognized it. No, he wasn't. A, you know, he's not one of those spiritual giants that you look back and go, I want to model my life. But, but if, you look, if you look at the biography, and you, and you can see God was at work in that life. God was, in fact, the hand of providence. Can you, let me ask you this. Whose workmanship are you? The apostle Paul said, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10, he said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Now, how was Paul what he was? What was the power that made him what he was? The grace of God. By the grace of God, I am what I am. So by what means are you what you are? That's the question. Now, how do you explain yourself and your identity? How do you explain who you are and what you are? Do you explain yourself by all the miserable things that people have done to you? 
and all of your past mistakes, the identifying sort of defining moments in your life or all your sin. It once was for Paul. He said, I was this. I was a blasphemer, an injurious. I, I was this. But God changed him. God made him into something else. He can say, by the grace of God, I am what I am. So that's what I was, but this is what I am. By the grace of God, I am what I am. By what power are you what you are? Are you still whining about your childhood? Still explaining your whole identity with the unmet needs, the, you know, the, the bitterness? Are you, are you a victim? How do you explain yourself and what are you? I'll tell you something. I'm going to tell you plainly. Joseph, at that season of life, was able to say to his brothers, you didn't make me. You didn't even send me here. Actually, God did. God who loves you, God who loves me, he sent me here. It was not you, it was God. I don't know that he would have said that when he was, you know, 18, shackled. But he's able to say it at 39. It was not you. It was God. The hand of providence has been at work in your life. No, you cannot blame God for the bad things that people did to you. You cannot blame God for people that might have molested you or victimized you in some other way. But you cannot deny that in his genius, God is able to use even that to bring about good. The worst things. The, the pain, the loss, the whatever. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Whose workmanship are you? Ephesians 2.10 says, We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God before ordained that we should walk in them. What are we supposed to be? Our identity? All right, let me, one more thing. You know what? The world has this all backwards. The world says you just obey a lust. You obey an urge, an appetite. You follow a desire. The desire leads to an action. The action leads to sort of an identity. It produces an identity. I'm a drug addict. I'm an outlaw. I'm whatever you might be. But God's intention is that it would be exactly the opposite. It would completely, it would, it would be the reverse of that. The intention of God is that we would find out from him an identity, who we are supposed to be. And out of that, our identity, we know what we're supposed to do. It leads to an action. And those actions produce the right kind of desires. If you've been living your life completely backwards, as Ephesians chapter 2 also describes, just being driven by your lust, turn to him. And say, who, who did you have in mind when you made me? What's your plan? Surrender to him. Surrender. Yield to the Lord. Yield to him and to that hand of providence that's been at work in your life that you've been resisting all of your life. It's like on the day of Pentecost when Peter preached. He acknowledged the, the sin of his own people. He indicted the religious leaders. He, he indicted the whole city. He said, you, he goes, according to the very foreknowledge of God, according to the very purpose of God, you took and with wicked hands you slayed him, the prince of life. According to the determined foreknowledge of God. And it was their sin, but it was God using it. And he did, in fact. And so also in your life. That's it. There are many things that we have in common with Joseph, my dear brothers. Those are some of them. But I say to you, I testify to you tonight as your brother. Your father does, in fact, love you, has a plan for your life, has an identity that he will impart to you. He'll tell you who you are. He'll show you who you are. Surrender your life completely to him. Stop identifying yourself by all that's been done to you or all that you have done. Stop assuming an identity that has been imposed upon you by circumstances or by heredity. Be God's son. Be the man that he had in mind when he made you. Truly great. Father, I pray in the name of Christ, Oh, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, your Son, that you would please illuminate our understanding of these things. I pray for everybody here, every man among us, Lord, 
tonight hearing these things, the youngest to the oldest, would you please speak to everyone here about them, about your love for them, your plan for them, and your genius, your ability to, as you said to the Apostle Paul, to cause all things to work together for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purpose. Only you and your genius can pull that out. There's nothing too hard for you. All things really means all things. That you're able to cause all things to work together. What a genius of a God you are. What a father. Help us to be wise enough to surrender our lives into the hands of such a God. Amen.